You're listening to the Financial Survival Network.com. I'm Kerry Lutz on 1490 WGCH. What has been going on with these markets? Is the system a scam? What can you do about it? And is there a 12-year-old out there who knows more than David Morgan and I put together? The answer to that is probably yes, but we'll let David Morgan talk about it. David, it's great to see you again, man. How are you? Kerry, it's great to be back with you. So this 12-year-old Canadian kid, she like, uh, you tweeted this out. She like gets it, right? Yeah, she really does. I think the whole video is like six minutes long and you know, I want to backtrack and I certainly don't want to sound like I'm patting myself on the back, although it may come across that way. But, you know, I was 11 years old when the coinage changed in, in the United States from the 90 percent silver coinage to what I call the Johnson slugs. And I noticed that, you know, and there weren't many to my recollection, there were no adults talking about it in my vicinity. We live pretty far out in the country, and, you know, 11-year-old kid isn't included in adult conversations very often. But the point being was I had, you know, that kind of woke me up a little bit. But here's this 12-year-old Canadian girl that basically pours out the whole banking system very succinctly to anyone that will listen. And I had that knowledge at probably 16 or so. And I was, um, you know, an early adopter. In other words, a lot of people, and you know from your show, Kerry, haven't really learned that the Fed is a privately run corporation that is held by basically commercial banks and others that profit. And anyway, she goes through the whole thing very succinctly. So I would just say kudos to her, kudos to the Canadians. I did tweet it out and thanks for mentioning it because of your listeners and i know you have quite a few if they would retweet it to uh friends and colleagues you know that say well i don't get it you know isn't the i you know someone has to run the banking system or whatever their excuse is for the truth i'd love to see this go viral hey you know uh that reminds me i think i've shared with you this story i was probably okay so i was eight years old in 19 um no, I'll take it back. I was, uh, in 1965, I was uh, eight years old, right? I was eight years old, and I remember my brother walking into the kitchen, and he had the old silver coins in one hand, and he dropped them on the floor, and they sounded like they had substance. They really rang. And then he dropped the Johnson slugs, and they sounded like tin. They were garbage. And just by listening to the things... It made an impression on me, David, and here we are today. We're discussing this. All right, this is 47 years ago. I'm, I'm on a show where I talk about the fake money system, about that very issue of those coins dropping on the floor. And here this kid is 12 years old. She obviously put it together a lot faster than I ever did. But, you know, put her, maybe she should do a special guest appearance with the Bears, you know, the bears who talk about uh, the Ben Bernanke and uh, the Goldman Sack and, uh, and all that. I don't know if you've caught that one, but it would be great to put her together with the bears to do a special on the monetary system, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have caught the bears, and you're right. And I don't want to digress too far from the main show, but sound money. A lot of that sound, it has multiple definitions, but part of the sound is the sound. I was with uh, one of the biggest... Uh, Bullion dealers in the world I lives in Los Angeles, good friend of mine, uh, recently, and we were talking about these counterfeit silver coins and bars that are now hitting, and they're mostly from China. And he brought me in a silver eagle, two of them, one real, one not. And he said, okay, Mr. Guru, which one is which? So I just took it on the table and I spun it because I've you know done that many times and have a pretty good idea what silver sounds like and then the other one i the first spin i was 90 percent sure i did it again i said this is the real one this isn't he goes you're right but um boy just looking at the darn things it's an awfully tough thing and you know i've been a little off on this carry because my thought was well, silver really isn't that expensive. I mean, per unit value, in other words, you know, a cell phone sized silver bar is still a thousand bucks. So certainly for something that small in volume, that's a lot of dough. But I thought, oh, you know, a coin, I mean, one ounce, why would it be worth, um, you know, counterfeiting that? Because it's really hard to counterfeit to get the weight just right. You can't yeah. really, you know, so 
the point is that uh, according to my friends there, and they had the proof in their hands, I mean, this is indisputable evidence. The evidence is there. They said the Chinese are selling these things for like a buck each. Well, if you could buy something for a dollar and put it into a treasury tube, let's say you bought a, a monster box. You have 500 ounces of treasury uh, silver liberties. Right. And you took out your 500 real eagles and you dumped in 500 eagles here in, you know, the, the casing and everything looks legit. And, you know, almost coin dealers are you know fairly busy. They go, you know, you bring it in. You say, uh, here's my eagles. Uh, you open and he opens it up and he dumps them out and he checks them out. And, you know, if he's in a hurry, he might not catch it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 30 times on your money is a pretty good markup, you know. So it's a problem. Uh, this gentleman, a friend of mine, he's going to be doing a series on it. I'll probably chime in. I talked to one of the biggest wholesalers in the country about the situation and he didn't urge me one way or the other, but he did indicate his preference would be for me to do some kind of an article, uh, about it. And that's not just me. It's a, you know, but it's for the industry. And quite honestly, Kerry, I didn't realize that, uh, the counterfeit of silver had gone this far. I mean, there's a lot of information out there about these tungsten, co- uh, tungsten gold bars, And no one knows how pervasive that situation is. But obviously, you know, it only takes one to prove that it's been done. Now, if it's been done once or a thousand times or multiple, you know, we don't know. But we do know that it's taken place. Same thing in the silver situation. But it is scary. Hey, Will, I'll go back to my little report on war nickels. Okay. So that was World War II. And they were just going to use copper and silver, 35% copper, 65 uh, 65% copper, 35% silver. What they found, though, was that those coins would not, uh, would basically trip the slug detectors in vending machines that they were using in World War II. So people were obviously counterfeiting nickels leading up to World War II, which is why they had slug detectors in the machine, and they had to put 9% manganese into these coins into these war nickels to stop them from tripping the slug detector so that tells you that counterfeiting has been with us for a long time and it's purely a question of economics if you can make a coin that looks good enough and you can use it in a vending machine or someplace else to get something of a greater value than it costs to counterfeit then people are going to try to do it and i guess we're all going to be walking around with little acid testers in our pockets here to test these things because there's really no other way. Yeah, you you were pretty sure there, but to be a hundred percent sure, you got to use the acid test, right? Yeah. Oh, well, okay, that's going to lead to another subject. There is other ways, uh, and we want to. You know, I come from the aircraft industry a million years ago. It wasn't quite a million, but you know, I that I've been in the metals business for a very long time. Anyway, the point being that. Uh, this guy got a hold of me in Canada the last time I was up there in January, so just a couple months back, and he has a non-destructive test. We call it NDT in in the industry. And it is a series of uh, magnets, rare earth element magnets, and what you do is you take your coin and you drop it and you time it. And depending on what is in that coin, it will drop at a certain rate because silver has different properties than, say, any other element. So if you make a slightly lead coin, anything that isn't exactly 999 fine will have it. And I thought, wow, how ingenious. Didn't take him very long. Thought of it on his own. In fact, his, uh, his phone number is on my desk as we're speaking. I'm going to give him a call. And uh, this is something I think would be very viable for you know, mom-and-pop coin dealers on up. Yeah. Where you could just, you know, and so it would be standard practice for the scenario I just went through that um, you go in and you say, here's my box of uh, silver eagles. And you say, that's fine. And you dump it in the big, uh, I forget what they're called, hopper at hopper, the top. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then they all go through. This is what they do on bags, by the way. I mean, if I go in for, and I've done this, I've sold, bought, and sold. I mean, it's not like I've always held everything I've bought. I've sold very, very little. But at times, I thought, you know, I'd rather trade these bags in and get a bar. I've done stuff like that. But, you know, you take a bag in, and they've got one of these coin counters in the back. I mean, bigger shops, not every little mom-and-pop coin dealer, but, the, you know, good size ones. And they just drop in the hopper, and they count it. 
they know how many you know silver coins are in there so anyway the point being is yes there are some non-destructive tests that can be done that doesn't alter anything and you don't have to use acid although there are several good tests that you can can be done and a lot of these guys the bigger going to the wholesaler i mean this guy just is no nonsense he basically chops these things in half yeah. and they cut them <laughs> they look they just cut them in well, half another thing like this goes back to the test you were talking about of the sound test there's ultrasound tests that you can hit the coin with a signal and you know the tuning basically it's a tuning pitchfork you know the tuning test and it's because pure silver is going to emit a signal at a certain vibration and adulterated silver is going to do it at a different vibration so there's a lot of you know ultrasound tests there's a lot of different tests my friend invented something that would find pipes with cracks in them by putting out an ultrasound signal and then seeing the vibration of the pipe because it was cracked it would put it out at a different vibration so they use them on aircraft uh ultrasound tests and no doubt there will be an ultrasound home test for precious metals there's no question because just like you said when you drop the johnson slugs they made a different sound they put out a different a different uh, audible audio wavelength than silver and that will be a bona fide test at some point it's like uh, 3d seismology when you get down to it you know they hit the plate on the ground the vibrations go into the ground and from that they map it and they'll be able to do the same thing. So we could think of a bunch of unique tests, and then let's go, let's put in our patent application, David, and uh, let's <laughs> let's go into business here, right? <laughs> right. Well, I might I might work a deal with this guy with this magnet. Here's a uh, sunshine bar, mm -hmm. and this is a counterfeit. Is it really? Yeah, pretty good. I'll wow. tell you. Now I didn't pick it up because it's in the plastic capsule. It's basically minted perfectly. And what Sunshine has done now is they have like a hologram in every one of these, even one ounce bars to, you know, as a uh, counterfeit uh, defeater, which it is. But can you believe that? I mean, again, I think God, the amount of work and trouble to make something that's, you know, roughly $30. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to make that in the U.S., counterfeit wise it probably cost you close to 30 yeah but uh with union labor these, right <laughs> yeah but with some of these um you know uh areas of the world that have labor costs that are next to nothing obviously it's worth it so it, again i don't want to belabor it too long we've talked about it quite a bit on your show but sure. it is something again that was brought to my attention that i knew existed but not to the level and not the the product uh situation i mean they are doing it in different venues in the silver and gold market so it's it again again is something that uh, demands some attention yeah and the banking system loves it because it undermines faith in precious metals and thereby makes people distrust uh, putting their wealth into metal right yeah oh yeah no well, they love it does yeah so and speaking of uh, the markets and faith and confidence we've had some some really major confidence rattling events where i've gotten emails from listeners where you've said you know i'm getting rid of my silver and gold they're the market's going to be fixed forever and uh, there's no point trying to beat the fed i can't beat them and that's that and i said well if you think that uh, that we we're smarter than the romans we're smarter than the greeks we're smarter than the byzantines and how many uh how many different fiat money systems did you count that all collapsed? If you think that we're smarter than all of them, then more power to you. Have fun. Yeah, agreed. I mean, uh, the Magambo guru, which we don't talk about much anymore. He is so funny, but he's on point. Yeah. Talks about Addison Wiggins. And when he went to work for Bill Bonner, one of the, according to uh, the Magambo, uh, the first uh, assignment, one of the first was for Addison to go through from A through Z and find all the fiat currencies, all the paper currencies that have failed and see how many, you know, didn't fail or whatever. And so Addison got through A, B, of course, Magambo does this much better than me, so express yeah. it. He, you know, he, goes, he goes ballistic. He goes, after B, he'd already discovered, you know, 400 currencies, 100% of them failed. They yeah. all failed. Just rants and rants and rants. <laughs> but that's the point. Yeah. And as you say, I'm just backing you up. 
and I've made similar statement. Well, if you think that, you know, because we have computers or because we're technologically advanced, or because we're so smart or because we're America or on and on, any excuse you want to make, you're making something that the history has always borne out doesn't work. And, you know, I mean, basically, and I made this point probably too many times, but it, I think bears repeating, you know, the, the U.S. Fed, or I should say the Federal Reserve, the private corp, says that their, by their own numbers that the nineteen thirteen dollars worth around three four cents that's optimistic and, that's generous yeah yeah i agree but let's say you know you have a hundred point quiz and you get four out of a hundred that's your score that's a failure <laughs> that's an f that's an f in grade school that's an f in college that's an f in graduate school it's an f anywhere that's an f failure 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 so they by their own admission they have failed but the quote unquote problem is and you know my opinion is, you know, that four cents that's left still, you know, if you take, uh, you know, 400 of them, you take $4 or $5 of fiat, you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I mean, I admit that, but it only works until it doesn't work and it's not working. I mean, there's all kinds of problems because of this. There's all kinds of misallocations of capital. There's tremendous problems throughout the globe. People are very, very upset, and rightfully so. And the problem, again, is going back to uh, Keynes himself. You know, not one man in a million can detect what's going on. And that's also part of the problem. They blame the governments. They blame the corporations. They blame – and there's blame to go around. Capitalism. Capitalism is always at fault. Hey, yeah. And you know the chart before the Federal Reserve, when you look at the purchasing power of the dollar, on average, it lost 0.3% per year from 1776 – to 1913 and the only time that the dollar lost purchasing power was during wars which are inherently inflationary so when you take that into account and then you look at what's happening now and you look at martin armstrong's research he's gone back like a thousand years studying uh, societies that collapsed on account of debt and originally the book was going to be a couple hundred pages and by the time he got to the middle ages it was over a thousand pages already of civilizations of societies collapsing because of excessive debt you put that two together debasement of currency excessive debt and that's the prescription for societal collapse and for uh, you know for for the downfall of uh, of just about every civilization in history i mean i'd like to know one that didn't collapse because of its monetary system and its uh, finances it, it just doesn't exist well, yeah, I I tend to agree with you. There is a book called uh, I think it's called Collapse of Complex Societies. I forget who wrote it. Oh yeah, right. It's a pretty good read. And in that book, there's it's a bunch of academics. It wasn't that easy to read, and I'm you know a pretty good reader. But anyway, the uh, you know the academics would do their their analysis after like the Byzantine and you know there would be arguments it was weather or it was a crop failure or it was this or that I mean I would always pretty much cite it was monetary in, most, in almost every case if not every but you could make a case of you know crop failure or you know whatever the point being is exactly what you said you know the, the we are on the same exact road to destruction which has always concerned me the most when I started writing on the internet was that it's not just Austria or uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany or Argentina, not that it isn't horrible, it happens anywhere, but these are isolated events that you might have had the opportunity to go to a different country or, you know, turn it around fairly, you know, quickly, relatively speaking. But this is a global event this time. This is going to affect everyone as the dollar goes. So, you know, the old expression as General Motors goes, so goes America. Well, look where General Motors is, yeah. government motors. And as the U.S. dollar goes, so goes the world. And I want to also address the word collapse because I think people, and this is my experience, Carrie, and maybe you, I'm sure you have an opinion on this, but People get, I think, the wrong idea about the word collapse. I think a lot of people, and it can mean a lot of things, but generally it seems that people are overreactive to that word. And in a lot of feedback that I get, the word collapse means that like everything burns to the ground and there's nothing left. Well, that's scorched earth policy. That's not a collapse. In a financial collapse, all the wealth remains there. In other words, all the roads, schools, uh, wheat fields, uh, oil wells, uh, you name it, the real wealth. I mean, money is a representation of wealth and precious metals store wealth because intrinsically they have value in and of themselves. 
but the wealth stays in place in a financial collapse. Now, there's lots of distortions, and there's lots of pain, and there's and it's not easy, and there's suffering. But it isn't as if everything gets burned to the ground. You got to start from zero. But you do have to realign, and you have to take the resources that are available, and you allocate them a lot better, and it isn't easy. But it isn't, I think, as bad as the kind of feedback I get when you use the word collapse, because, again, a lot of people seem to overreact. What's your experience with that word? Well, I think um, there's different levels, and there's different uh, phases. And arguably, you could say we had the collapse in 2008, and we're still trying to uh, deny its existence. But... You know, there are, you know, there is different phases, like there's the Mad Max beyond Thunderdome type collapse where it all just dissolves, all the bonds of society dissolves, and you're fighting over containers of gasoline. Or there's other ones where, you know, you have a chaotic period of time like Weimar Germany, and then order kind of reasserts itself because we can't live without a monetary unit. I mean, everyone agrees on this. Society is way too complex, but... You know, the system now will collapse, but we might acknowledge it prior to that happening and implement a new system, go back to the tried and true sound money, or we might just have to uh, watch all the markets kind of melt down. But at some point, the chaos will end and a new system will start because the alternative is going to be too horrible. And I do believe, David, that when push comes to shove, all the leaders of the world will sit down at the table And they'll come up with something else, whether that'll work or not, how long it'll work for, I don't know. But I don't believe that that the leaders are just going to sit by and watch the whole thing, you know, go down the drain. And you're right, you know, like at a certain level, all the wealth is still there, but it's a question of who owns it and how do you pay the the, uh, mandarins to administer the system when the government doesn't have any gold? How do you pay the cops? You know, then we kind of reorganize society into totally different working units than we have now. So I'm the first to admit, David, I have no idea how this thing is going to shake out. I'm hopeful that the world is going to sit down right at the precipice and come up with a system that even if it's not going to work for the long term, will avert what's going to happen. Whether it's a world currency, I don't know whether it's somehow tied to gold and silver or mainly gold. There's not enough silver. We know that. I don't know what it's going to be, but I do believe that's going to happen before we have this all-out, uh, you know, global chaos. But then again, if Italy can elect that crazy guy, who we won't even get into his his series of vices, then anything is possible in the world, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got a great sense of humor, and you got to keep one in this world. But I agree. I won't comment further other than to just uh, back you up. No one knows, so it could be, yeah. you know, really bad. It could be a uh, tough transition. Who knows? But you're right. There's a lot that's out there, and and we are. And I think the other point I said I'd say one. I'll say two things. Is it probably did happen in 2008? And it is just, you know, we're kind of hobbling along and, you know, pretending like we're going to, it's being fixed. But, you know, the Keynesian model is you prime the pump and you stimulate the economy and you get cash flowing throughout the system. And, you know, all, everyone basically does better because you've got a higher velocity of money. And, yeah, you pay a little bit of a price of inflation, but we can control that, too. And on you go. But, you know, that was the whole idea of QE1, 2, 3, and 4, and it's not working. And that's when you know you're at the end. I've been criticized and many of my ilk about, well, you guys have been saying this for years. And I heard this when I started the speaking circuit over a decade ago. And one of the brokers in Canada, nice guy, but he was kind of like, you know, more mainstream, you might say. He said, oh, we've heard that from, you know, Vern Myers. We've heard it from, you know, so-and-so and and -and so-and-so. And he was right. And I kind of went back to the Ayn Rand situation, check your premises. And I came to the conclusion fairly easily after thinking and it's basically Keynesian model doesn't work forever. And that's the point. We've hit the limit. And the limit is simply that it doesn't work at a certain point. So by priming the pump and adding more money to the system, it should stimulate economic activity. QE1 didn't work. QE2 did not work. Operation Twist did not work. QE3 did not work. And QE4 is not working. Clearly, we have hit the limit. Clearly, the limit has been reached. And therefore, it's not a hypothesis. It's not a theory. It's a fact. We've hit the limit. And... Uh, the trail from here on is uncharted, and as you outlined, whatever collapse 
takes place. It is happening. Only very few people are really willing to admit it or actually acknowledge it. Hey, and that is the saddest part, David, is that so many people are in denial. 99 percent. I mean, I was at a I was at a polo match. Don't hold it against me. But, you know, being new to Florida, you got to go to a polo match just to find out how meaningless the game is and how boring it is. But, uh, you know, I'm looking around at all these people, super, super wealthy people go to polo. So they have something to do with themselves, I think, on a Sunday. And, and none of them, none of them, David, had a clue. You know, like I keep uh, three uh, ounces of, of silver in my pocket and, you know, take it out to talk to people. And, I've, you know, the past month I found one person who had a clue who knew what the price of silver was. And I meet a lot of people. So, you know, it's the kind of thing that uh, my friend over at Regal Assets, Tyler Gallagher, said is... People are not going to accept it until they have no other choice but to accept it. And that point is coming down the road, and we just don't know when. Very good. Well, thank you, Kerry. It's hey. great to be with you again. Always a pleasure. Hey, don't forget silver-investor.com, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. We always tap into David's latest uh, public articles on the site. You can always find them there. David, uh, we'll see you soon, and you be well. Thank you. Thank you. 